Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir ici et au nom de la Bibliothèque publique d'information, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Donc euh, aujourd'hui euh, et demain auront lieu ce, ce colloque international sur cultural studies et critique marxiste. Euh, nous sommes très heureux parce que euh, c'est un courant d'études qui intéresse particulièrement la, la BPI. On travaille, c'est un de nos axes de programmation culturelle. Et euh, nous avons organisé d'ailleurs en 2009 une journée d'études sur ce, sur ce thème. Et puis, euh, nous sommes heureux aussi parce que c'est un beau programme. Et euh, je tiens à remercier euh, euh, l'équipe d'organisation. Donc, Maxime Servul, Maxime Boidy, Christophe Magis, David Buxton et Marc Kaiser pour euh, l'excellence le, de cette programmation. Et aussi le Labex euh, Art H2H qui a permis son organisation. Je laisse la parole à Maxime Servul, qui est un des maîtres d'œuvre de ce colloque. Merci. Bonjour. Alors j'aimerais tout d'abord vous remercier d'être ici présent pour, pour ce colloque, qui est donc consacré au dialogue, aux tensions et aux confrontations entre les cultural studies et le marxisme. Ce colloque, évidemment, il n'aurait pas pu voir le jour sans le soutien d'un certain nombre de, de partenaires, que je vais donc remercier ici. La bibliothèque publique d'information, d'abord, qui nous accueille aujourd'hui, le Labex Art H2H, la Maison des sciences de l'homme Paris Nord, l'équipe d'accueil Histoire des arts et des représentations, et le CEMTI, Centre d'études sur les médias, les technologies et l'internationalisation. Je tiens également à remercier les membres du comité d'organisation, à mon tour, Isabelle Bastien Duplex, Christophe Magis, David Buxton, Marc Kaiser et tout particulièrement Maxime Boidy qui a joué un rôle absolument central dans l'organisation de ce colloque. Je remercie aussi G.D. Daya Sklower qui va réaliser aujourd'hui une performance sans filet puisqu'il va traduire en simultané les communications en anglais de ce colloque. Je souligne donc que ceux et celles qui voudraient bénéficier d'une traduction simultanée en français euh, peuvent le faire. Euh, il vous suffit d'aller récupérer des casques euh, qui sont juste à l'entrée de la salle. Je remercie également les stagiaires qui viennent nous prêter main forte durant cet événement. Maria Alcala, Lucille Coquelin et Christelle Séguin, ainsi que le régisseur de la BPI, Renaud Gis. Enfin, je remercie chaleureusement les intervenants et les intervenantes qui ont accepté de, de venir débattre aujourd'hui, de venir présenter leurs travaux et tout particulièrement ceux et celles qui sont venus de Londres, de Dublin, de Belfast, de Bristol, de Manchester ou de Birmingham. Ce colloque, euh, le colloque d'aujourd'hui, vise autant à explorer l'histoire des cultural studies qu'à activer leurs présents multiples et à donner à voir leur potentiel critique. Ce potentiel critique des cultural studies a sous certains aspects un air de famille avec le marxisme. Pourtant, la définition de la critique que portent les cultural studies, excède parfois sa compréhension marxiste. Stuart Hall disait en 1992 que la rencontre des cultural studies britanniques et du marxisme doit d'abord être comprise comme un engagement, non pas avec une théorie, ni même avec une problématique, mais avec un problème. Les cultural studies émergent en effet de certains des points aveugles de la théorie et de la politique marxiste, notamment telle qu'elle était pratiquée dans les années 1960 en Grande-Bretagne. Ce qu'on conteste alors, c'est l'eurocentrisme du marxisme, sa dimension téléologique ou alors son réductionnisme économique. Avec les cultural studies, il va s'agir d'inventer un nouveau mode de critique qui prenne au sérieux l'idée de détermination multiple, au-delà de la simple détermination économique, et pour penser l'entrelacement précisément de l'économique, du politique et du culturel dans les existences. Avant de se déployer progressivement au sein de, du lieu où vont éclore les cultural studies, le Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies de Birmingham, ce projet théorique va d'abord émerger de la New Left, au courant de la gauche britannique, au sein de laquelle Stuart Hall plaide déjà, au tout début des années 60, en faveur d'une stratégie de transformation sociale qui doit passer par un engagement, selon lui, avec la question de la culture. Dans un plaidoyer de 1960, qui évoque l'appel de Gramsci à une révolution du sens commun, 
Graham, euh, Stuart Hall écrit « Ce dont nous avons besoin, c'est de déclarer notre révolte contre l'ordre dans un langage au plus près de la vie, dans tous ses aspects. » Ce langage de la révolte, il s'est construit durant ces 50 dernières années au croisement de différentes paroles venues des marges. Les luttes ouvrières, mais aussi les luttes décoloniales, les luttes antiracistes, les féminismes et la critique queer. Cette hybridation du langage de la critique a bien entendu fait l'objet au cours du temps de nombreuses contestations de la part des différentes écoles de pensée inspirées par le marxisme, pour n'en citer que deux, je pense par exemple à l'économie politique de la communication ou encore à certaines formes contemporaines euh, critiques issues de l'école de Francfort. C'est cette histoire dans ses différentes dimensions, dans sa densité que ce colloque souhaite raconter. Il va s'agir d'abord en dénudant les fils des querelles de donner à voir ce que ces différents projets critiques peuvent avoir en commun, malgré leurs différences. D'autre part, il va s'agir aussi de penser les usages politiques des cultural studies dans la conjoncture actuelle. La première journée de ce colloque propose une plongée dans le centre de Birmingham et dans la pensée de Stuart Hall. Elle donnera aussi à voir certains des points de friction saillants entre les cultural studies et des options critiques qui se sont focalisées sur l'antagonisme de classe. La seconde journée reviendra sur les façons par lesquelles la politique de l'identité vint aux cultural studies. Elle donnera à voir la redéfinition du politique et de la conception du peuple qui accompagne cette politisation de l'identité. Enfin, il a toujours été important pour les cultural studies britanniques de penser le dehors de l'université. Aussi, la table ronde qui clôt ces deux journées va-t-elle donner à voir l'un de ces dehors, en l'occurrence le domaine de la production culturelle, puisque nous allons poser la question de l'influence qu'ont pu avoir les cultural studies sur les arts et les médias en Grande-Bretagne. Je terminerai cette courte introduction avec une information pratique. N'hésitez pas à faire savoir à celles et ceux qui n'ont pas pu être parmi nous que le colloque est intégralement retransmis en direct sur le site de la BPI. Je vais maintenant laisser la place à Mark Kaiser et Gregor McLennan en souhaitant que nos débats durant ces deux jours nous permettent d'envisager sous un nouveau jour l'apport des cultural studies pour à la fois penser et agir sur les multiples fronts de conflictualité sociale. Je vous remercie, je vous souhaite un très bon colloque. Bonjour à tous, euh, merci Maxime. Merci beaucoup à Gregor McLennan d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Donc je vais le présenter en quelques mots et puis introduire rapidement sa conférence d'aujourd'hui. Donc vous êtes actuellement directeur de l'école de sociologie, de politique et d'études internationales de l'université de Bristol, que vous avez rejoint en 1997. Vous êtes également titulaire de la chaire de sociologie et membre de l'Académie des sciences sociales. Vous avez été directeur du département de sociologie de 2000 à 2003 et de l'Institut pour les recherches avancées de 2009 à 2012. Vous avez commencé votre carrière d'enseignant à l'Open University en 1979 jusqu'en 1991, donc avant de prendre la, département, la direction du département de sociologie à l'université de Massé en Nouvelle-Zélande au cours des années 90. Vous avez d'abord étudié la philosophie, la littérature à Bristol avant de vous inscrire à Birmingham au moment où vous étiez je vous cite, une sorte de marxiste, some kind of marxist. Euh, votre père a d'ailleurs été le secrétaire général du Parti communiste de Grande-Bretagne. Vous souhaitiez alors développer une théorie sociale critique de la philosophie et de la littérature. You wanted to do something like a critical theory approach to both philosophy and literature. Ce qui vous a conduit à rejoindre la première cohorte de Mastorant du centre à partir de l'automne 1975. C'est une de vos enseignantes d'anglais, qui est passée par le centre pendant un an, qui vous a suggéré de vous y inscrire car elle pensait que sa culture collective du débat et son intérêt pour la théorie abstraite vous conviendraient mieux que le département de sociologie. It's an English teacher who thought it would suit you because of its collective culture of debate and its developing interest in abstract theory at the center. Um, vous avez ensuite entamé un travail de thèse sur le marxisme et l'histoire sous la direction de Richard Johnson avant d'obtenir un premier poste à l'Open University, donc en 1979. Euh, je vais juste me permettre de raconter une petite anecdote que vous avez révélée à ce sujet dans l'entretien réalisé par Vincent Houston en 2011. 
Euh, comme vous ne vouliez pas que euh, l'on pense que c'est Stewart Hall qui vous a euh, appu appuyé votre candidature, parce que lui-même, cette même année, il a obtenu une chaire de l'Open University, à euh, l'Open University, pardon, euh, vous ne lui avez rien dit avant de lui demander le premier jour de votre, euh, de, de votre nouveau travail de vous y conduire pour euh, le suivre à l'Open University. Donc voilà la petite anecdote. Euh, vous êtes l'auteur de six ouvrages, donc Marxism and the Mythology of History, Marxism, Pluralism and Beyond, and Sociological Cultural Studies. Vous avez coédité et participé à plusieurs ouvrages du Centre. Vous avez récemment écrit sur le Cultural Turn en sociologie et dans les études culturelles, sur Stewart Hall et sur la laïcité. Et vos recherches portent plus largement sur la théorie sociale, l'idéologie, la politique, la philosophie des sciences sociales. Aujourd'hui, votre conférence s'intitule Sartre and Mediator, The Commitment to Marxism and Stuart Hall's Trajectory. Vous y abordez donc la question du marxisme, du marxisme chez Stuart Hall, en tenant compte de son style particulier de théorisation et de médiation intellectuelle. Vous appuyez sur certaines spécificités non marxistes du travail de médiateur en ajoutant des thématiques sartriennes et l'importance connue de la pensée gramsienne dans les travaux de Hall. Vous montrez finalement que Stewart Hall ne pouvait pas ignorer la critique marxiste et qu'il faut procéder à une réévaluation de la valeur comparative de certains de ses écrits créés. Je vous laisse donc la parole. Je vous remercie. Good morning, everybody, and, uh Many thanks to Mark, Maxime, and Isabel for those uh, very warm words of welcome. Uh, I'll have to apologize straight away that Brexit makes it even more unforgivable that British people can't engage in proper cosmopolitan communication with their imperialist language that leaves them able to be lazy. So my apologies for that, but I, I will carry on uh, in English. Uh, the conference is very welcome, I, I think, in particular. Um, cultural studies always seems to be at some kind of threshold, conjuncture or other, where one wonders, what is it and where is it going? And I think with the passing of Stuart Hall, at a time of the intensification of neoliberalism and uh, corporate capitalism generally, if there was one winner in the uh, Brexit campaign on either side, it was the power of corporate capital, because no politics seems to be in any way viable unless it seems to go along with the interests of, uh, of finance capital. An extraordinary proposition Uh, even compared with 30, 30 years ago. So the question of Marxism has never been sharper, funnily enough, because in the 80s and 90s, most cultural studies people, including Stuart Hall himself, seemed to be almost, almost on the verge of not really being Marxist at all. But I think that the question of Marxism is now clearly more uh, uh, sharper now That, than it was in the 80s and, and 90s. And, and to me, that's a good thing, because I've always been, as Mark said, some kind of Marxist. Uh, and I think the, the, the very, uh, very general punchline of my talk today is that so was Stuart Hall. Some kind of Marxist, never quite completely post-Marxist, and I'll explain why this apparently rather banal Uh, generalization actually helps us uh, resituate Stuart's work and therefore with the passing of Stuart Hall poses even more sharply the question of is there a cultural studies without some kind of Marxism? Um, you can certainly have critical cultural studies of all kinds but what is it that binds those critical perspectives in some paradigmatic unity even at a very high level and so indirectly I'm posing that question and I'm certainly hoping to learn a lot from my fellow speakers over the course of these next two days uh, to, to educate me uh, about how I might regard uh, a quasi non post uh, Marxist view of critical cultural studies. The other thing that 
I, I have to confess that although I was at the Birmingham Cultural Studies Center for many years and I worked with Stuart Hall for many years, I have never really felt completely in the inner circle of cultural studies or, or even really part of the cultural studies network. I kind of gravitated, as, as Mark explained, I kind of gravitated towards uh, critical sociology and I saw strengths in sociology that I felt were often rubbished too easily by the uh, cultural studies in crowd. Um, so I've always found it interesting to touch base with my feelings about uh, cultural studies and its, and its rather internalist form of discourse. Part of this problem, of course, is Stuart Hall himself, a uniquely canonical figure such that it's hard to think of any other intrinsic leader of cultural studies than Stuart Hall. When, they dis when you discuss the classics of cultural studies, and certainly in Britain, the names of Raymond Williams and E.P. Thompson come up, but they didn't see themselves as cultural studies leaders at all. In fact, in some ways, certainly Thompson was very critical of cultural studies. So Stuart Hall is the canonical figure, and so whenever you get discussions about what's theory, why is theory important, how can we develop good theory to intervene in the practical world? Of course, but just good theory itself. Somehow, cultural studies occasionally doesn't even come across as wanting to ask that question, whereas I always want to ask that question, and I find in critical sociology and sociological and uh, uh, cultural theory slightly outside the cultural studies corpus, one is allowed to just ask those rather simple intellectual questions. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is resituate Stuart and his Marxism question mark um, with just bringing in a few references to people, thinkers, ideas that are not traditionally part of the cultural studies in-house uh, vocabulary. At least I think, insofar. Correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. And I think that it throws light on Stuart's uh, Marxism to just come at it at a slightly lateral angle by talking a little bit about what kind of intellectual he was, what sort of theory he engaged in. In the, in the cultural studies in crowd, there's a sense in which whatever, whatever Stuart did, it must have been a, a new kind of distinctive theory. And so even when Stuart is pitched as a conjunctural interventionist uh, academic intellectual, that's taken to be a special kind of theory. And, and I'm not convinced that, that that's the case, or at least I think it's worth looking into with, with, some, with some rigor. Uh, and the overall uh, thread that I'll be proposing is that Stuart didn't have, as some cultural studies commentators insist, he had a special independent theory of articulation, the way in which the cultural and non-cultural, the epistemological and the ontological, the subjective, the psychoanalytic and the material all sort of somehow speak to each other. Uh, I think they do articulate with each other, but that's not exactly a theory. That's just, that's just a problem situation that anybody trying to explain anything has to face. But where Stuart, I think, is very definitely unique, and he is theoretical, I'm not saying he's not theoretical, but his theory is of a more... Uh, is, of a, is of a more intellectually mediational kind. I'll explain what that means. Uh, sev several terms that I'm going to mention appear to be somewhat bland, mediator, moderator, but I'll try to convey that there's actually fresh insight to be produced with these kinds of terms. So I'm going to start uh, by drawing on uh, Zygmunt Bauman's distinction between different types of intellectuals. There are many schemas of intellectuals. We, we probably know this. Uh, there's Foucault's universal and particular intellectual. There's Gramsci's organic and traditional, and so on and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and by the way, I should put in a, a strong caution here, because although, I, although some of the categories I'll be explaining do have feminist exemplars, one might think of Spivak or Nancy Fraser or something like that, uh, I think uh, I'm aware that the whole business of theorizing intellectuals and producing typologies of intellectuals could be seen as, as a bit of a boy's game. It's, some, it's, something, it's something the men do uh, to give themselves a certain kind of uh, 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 elevated status. Uh, so I'm just, uh, I'll park that for now and get on with it, but I am aware that this is, this is an important question that feminists uh, traditionally pose, quite rightly. So let's look at Bowman. Bowman made this distinction between uh, legislators and interpreters. Legislators were the modernist, controlling, naming the world, oracular, defining theorists, the ones that shifted our fundamental paradigms of understanding and were linked to uh, episodes of various kinds of social engineering, as against and succeeded by the postmodern interpreter, much more dialogical, conversational, pluralistic, to the point where nothing is really believed as such because all propositions, theories, controlling impulses are put under erasure. Those are, those are Bowman's two categories. Heuristically, extremely useful. Not correct, because he posed them in a historical sequence that I think is manifestly not true. Legislators, modernity, interpreters, postmodernity. And not completely uh, adequate because there's a middle category, I think, and that's the category of the mediator. And I want to suggest that Stuart Hall's modus operandi is very much that of the mediator, pitched somewhere between, but never letting go of the oscillation or, or, or synthesis of the legislator and the interpreter. Now, this might look like heresy to some cultural studies uh, people because you find in the literature around Stuart uh, the notion that if we return, for example, to his reading, this was 1973, first published, uh, uh, the reading of Marx's introduction in 1857 to the Grundrisse manuscripts, then you find a specific theory in Stuart Hall that is either or both, A, a distinctive interpretation of what Marx was doing, and secondly, uh, uh, out of that reading and engagement with Marx, Stuart Hall produces something like the method of cultural studies. And this is why uh, th 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 this is often uh, discussed either as a theory of articulation in general or as uh, a position that is uh, radical, radically contextualist theorizing or radical conjuncturalist theorizing. Now, I haven't got time to do this now. If we were to break up into small groups for three hours, I would hope to persuade you uh, that what I'm just going to assert can be most conclusively demonstrated, but we're not going to do that now. Um, what I will say is that actually, although people tend to look back and see Stuart's reading of Marx in that 1973 essay as almost the pinnacle of his own manifest independent theoretical construction, I, I think it's, it's exactly what he told us it was. <laughs> a messy reading uh, 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 produced in and for and with the cultural studies theory group, just trying to kick around some ideas about Hegel, Marx, cultural studies, and so on. It's very much a working paper. There's nothing more polished or conclusive to be gleaned from it. 
Um, now, that seems quite harsh, but um, the, the, there are at least two major areas about the 1857, the reading of the 1857 introduction that are highly problematical. First of all, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping you're a bit familiar with the 1857 introduction by Marx as well as Stuart's work. So you'll, you'll remember that there's a whole episode, the first major phase of Marx's essay talks about the way in which production, consumption, distribution, exchange uh, intermediate each other, sometimes in the form of an immediate identity, consumption is production, production is consumption, and then in various ways in which those four nodes uh, mediate each other. They are the goals of each other, they form part of a differentiated unity, and so on and so forth. Now, Stuart knows that, and he can see that, but he actually argues that what Marx is trying to do is critique Hegel's naively identitarian understanding of the relationship between production, consumption, distribution, and exchange. And actually, Hegel does nothing of the sort. Hegel critiques exactly those philosophers, and I think he has Spinoza in mind, but he doesn't actually say in, in, the, in Hegel's logic, he doesn't say it, but I think he has Spinoza in mind, whereby apparent opposites form part of a monistically fused conceptual ontology. ontology. So, in fact, what Stuart says is Marx's great achievement in that canonical writing is, uh, uh, is in Hegel. All the great phrases that we think are Marx's and that cultural studies people think are Stuart's, the movement from abstraction to the concrete as the product of a rich totality of multiple determinations, the synthetic unity of diversity in identity. All these phrases are straight out of Hegel's logic. And one of the problems with the, with the text in Marx is that Mar I think Marx kind of ultimately gives up on trying to wrestle a position of his own that's different from Hegel's apart from a very arbitrary decision on Marx's part that production in this, in this cycle um, is, the key, is the key point. It's rather arbitrarily decided, in fact. So don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking uh, Stuart's brilliant essay, and we all learned heaps from it. But it doesn't produce what, uh, what cultural studies people tend to derive from it, namely a theory of articulation, or a particularly historicized epistemology. Marx never actually tells us how we get from the false abstraction of general categories like population to something much more determinate and specific and concrete. He never tells us how we do that. He just sort of assumes that that's what good stuff does. And also, we've forgotten that by determinations, a rich totality of multiple determinations, there's a Hegelian aspect in that as well, because for Hegel and for Marx of that era, not the later Marx, uh, the question of determination is not a simple causal material one. X is the determining condition of Y. It's more of a kind of constitutive conceptual strategy one has to say, here's what, I don't know, here's what a, revo a, a revolution means. What, here's what a social revolution means. Uh, we would expect a social revolution to have certain kinds of determinations in it. Peasant revolt, rise of an urban bourgeois class, and so on. So for Hegel and for Marx, there's a conceptually specifying element of determination that we've forgotten about, and that Stuart forgot about. So, this is just one rather scholastic way of trying to insist that Stuart didn't really operate, and he always told us he didn't operate well 
at the level of independent theoretical construction. And so it's part of my uh, proposition that he never left and never could leave Marx and Marxism behind. And so what he's really doing is just helping us think of what Marx is doing in that very complex and actually completely unresolved text, which is why he gave it up, as a matter of fact. Marx. Okay. So let me return then. That, that would be my argument against anyone from within cultural studies who wants to say, ah, but look at the, 18, the reading of the 1857 introduction. That's, that's Hall. It's all Hall. None of it's Marx. None of it's Hegel. I think that's mistaken. Um, so let's think more about this category of mediator because it sounds a bit, sounds a bit boring, sounds a bit bland. Sounds what you do when you want to bring different partnership partners in a relationship together and it just won't work anyway. So you're wasting your time. Mediation. Um, but mediation is an interesting category if you push it a little bit more deeply. And here I want to just very eclectically draw on some strands of thought from outside the Marxist and cultural studies traditions to try and uplift, upgrade this category of the mediator. Bruno Latour, not normally counted on the Marxism uh, side of, of social analysis, but I think Bruno Latour is an extremely interesting, fertile thinker, and we can draw on his insights for any purpose we like. He makes a distinction between mediators and intermediaries. Intermediaries, and he's talking about things, circuits of, of material entities, but I'm just pretending that he's talking about mediators as people. Um, intermediaries are the sort of phenomenon and people who merely reflect, reproduce something given in the structure of society. A pre-existing, relatively stable uh, 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 underbelly of social structure. Intermediaries reflect that. Um, mediators for Latour are different. He says it's sometimes just a hair's breadth difference. And you think, well, what does that mean? Um, but he says that if you look closely, mediators transform, translate, rearticulate repose the stuff that we think they reflect. And the stuff that we think they reflect are not social structures, they're controversies. Basic kind of issues and, and movements and ways of being that will never come to an unproblematic synthetic unity they just get reposed and reconstituted through the work of dynamic mediators. Now, I think you can look at Stuart Hall this way because Stuart never actually resolves or leaves behind or transcends basic things like the culture and society couplet that he inherited from Raymond Williams and never lets go of, actually. Or the basic Marxist paradigmatic problem of the work of the determining structures and the relative autonomy of the cultural superstructures. These are kind of problems, controversies, issues that Stuart's sort of quite happy never to quite stabilize. They define his problem field and in his own brilliant work of rearticulating, this is where articulation is important, rearticulating these given problems, somehow we're taken on to a more productive space. That's the work of a great mediator. Um, I should be looking at time, good, shouldn't good, I? Good, uh, how, how long have I got? Half an hour. Good, okay. So I'll just mention one or two other uh, 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 possible leads that will upgrade this notion of the mediator. The sociologist, the American sociologist Mark Granovita, uh, 
as early as 1973, produced the beginnings of a sophisticated network theory um, called the strength of weak ties. And he identified as the, a crucial way of getting from micro-sociology to macro-sociology is the work of what he called people who are bridges. People who somehow take the detail of their own context and make it larger in social and cultural space. And I think this is a brilliant way of looking at Stuart Hall again. If you think of all the different audiences, constituencies, subcultures who regarded Stuart as wonderful, animating, central to their own self-conceptions, you, you know, the, the, the range of groups is incredible. Not just academic sociologists or activist cultural studies people, but community educators, literacy educators, uh, black metropolitan artists of an avant-garde type. The, the range of people who see Stuart as theirs, that's our Stuart, they would say. Stuart would laugh and they'd all say, oh, great. That's our Stuart. We all did it. This was part of his incredible power of interpolation. We all thought, that's our Stuart. We are, we are hailed. But the diversity of intellectual and practical communities who held this, this uh, is extraordinary. The Open University itself, you might not know very much about it in France, was a quite remarkable social democratic experiment that reached hundreds of thousands of ordinary people drawn into courses about crime, popular culture, and so on. And Stuart would go out to meetings and tutorial groups throughout the UK to talk to these people, and they came away singing in their heads. That guy, Stuart, wow. And the funny thing about Gran, Gran Overtor's theory is that it's the strength of weak ties that makes this bridge that takes a micro-sociological subculture into bigger public relevance. Uh, and the weak tie just means that Stuart didn't actually belong to any one of those communities decisively. He was a kind of part of all and none. Uh, and that's the hallmark of a great mediator. One last, uh, one last uh, uh, example from a literature that's got nothing to do really with cultural studies or Marxism, namely the sociology of science. There's a guy called Harry Collins, very fine sociologist of science, and he has given us what he humbly calls uh, a new periodic table of expertise. He's a modest, modest character. And uh, he identifies basically two kinds of experts. One is the contributory propositional expert, and he's thinking mainly of scientists, actually, you know, the definers of subatomic particle theory or something like that. But it stretches to anything you want to, to stretch to. And then interactional experts. This is my mediator. Interactional experts are still experts. They're not just uh, uh, filters or, or funnels. Th th there's work there. There's intellectual work to be done. And the work that's to be done, uh, the expertise in question, is a knowledge, a profound tacit knowledge, not an explicit knowledge, but a tacit form of knowledge of the particular culture of debate and discovery that we're talking about. And a profoundly personal, we mustn't, you know, I'm not, by doing all this stuff about mediator categories, I'm not for one minute saying that Stuart just wasn't, I mean, he was just a brilliant, a brilliant individual with a radiant personality. But we still have to sort of theorize it somewhat. And this is the way I theorize it in Collins's terms. Stuart was an interactional expert, working through tacit knowledge, profound understanding of the enculturation of particular debates and, and issues. And, Collins argues, in science and society generally, these communicative, interactional experts are more and more important. 
And I think that's why Stuart did, did become actually more important as his life went along uh, uh, from, from days when only three and a half people knew him at Birmingham. Okay, so I'm trying to persuade you that this concept of the mediator can be interestingly uh, 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 illuminated by references to non-Marxist and non-cultural studies theorists, and that it applies to Stuart Hall. I've actually got another section that I'll skip, which is about rhetoric, because Stuart was a profoundly persuasive and charismatic speaker, not all the time, as I'll come to, come to say. Um, so we need to know about what, what, what is the rhetorical mechanics of being a great mediator. But um, I haven't got time to go into that. I draw there, again, on someone who hardly anybody knows, and that's uh, 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 Rika Edmondson, who wrote a great book in 1984 called Rhetoric in Sociology. Okay, so I'm trying to persuade you that, that mediator is a perfectly good, indeed inspired category, not, not a dumbing down category to use if someone as great as Stuart Hall. And now I need to tell you why that's related to what I see as his baseline Marxism. First of all, why do we want to rescue his Marxism? Here I think we just need the briefest of panoramas uh, uh, on, on the intellectual critical scene because I think that we've reached a point where a whole spate of critiques of critique very powerful critiques of critique went on, especially during the 1990s, and they've now kind of run their course. I mentioned Latour. Latour's critique of sociologists of the social, that's people who think that there's this thing called society that determines anything else, um, and he says that that is, that's a Sociology and cultural studies have a kind of little internal war, but Latour says they're all, they all still inhabit the society culture uh, uh, upward arrow uh, uh, configuration in order to pinpoint, situate, analyze how particular cultural forms came to be. But then the second part of the two-step is the progressive method. And here, I don't know if it's the same in France, it probably is, but in the UK, there's quite a big, uh, uh, quite a big um, fan club for vitalist or neo-vitalist modes of understanding. And I think Sartre provides just exactly where that comes in, in a way that Stuart Hall uh, would appreciate. Because for, for Sartre, even if we are all thoroughly situated and can only be explained in our being by the categories of historical materialism, etc., Marxism generally. Nevertheless, uh, what we choose to do, which will be predictable, uh, no, no, which, 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 which will be understandable, is never predictable, because we are always faced in our actions in the present with a range of possibles, only some of which can be realized. And we can't determine which ones will be realized because, says Sartre, the progressive moment of culture, politics, subjectivity is constantly to orientate ourselves towards a different future. This is what he calls the project. And the project is orientated to possibility. He's got a, a couple of lovely neo-vitalist phrase, especially, he says, uh, this is about the profundity of the lived. Um, now, it's interesting that, that those kind of phrases, the profundity of lived, the, the lived orientation towards possibility, those are the kinds of phrases that many post-Marxist theorists think spell the ruin of Marxism, the inadequacy of Marxism. But Sartre doesn't think that. And I actually think his progressive, regressive, progressive way of talking about methodology and understanding is, is better, for example, than talking about structure and culture, structuralism, culturalism, individual society. So um, 
So I would recommend having another look at Jean-Paul Sartre's question of method, and I think this exactly captures the spirit of Stuart Hall. He never, ever says we have no need for structural, historical, materialist, situational analysis of anything because we can't determine where things came from, what, what their social logic is without that Marxist background. But uh, Marxism in and of itself just cannot tell us how to appreciate, never mind uh, predict, where these profoundly lived history on the move, experiments, movements, and aspirations are going to take us. And this was Stuart Hall's cultural studies. He did not want us to lose the explanatory anchors, but he did want us to be descriptively appreciative and to develop independent categories and sensibilities to grasp this history on the move. Good, um, okay. Well, um, in five minutes I can't now See, what I need to do now, just to keep you persuaded of this, is go through the entire uh, oeuvre of Stuart Hall's writings to, to tell you, to show you exactly what, why what I'm saying is the right way to look at it. I should say, by the way, that I'm doing this partly because there's going to be a terrific series of collections of Hall's writings published by Duke University Press, over the next several years, um, probably six or seven volumes, and I'm meant to be editing and framing the volume on Stuart Hall and Marxism. So at some point, I'm going to have to bore whoever reads that with my run through the entire genre work of Stuart Hall to prove my point. But uh, just very, uh, um, here's what I would say in terms of the, you see, one of the things that always worried me about cultural studies insiders is that you could never criticize Stuart. And it was partly because I don't think we had the tools to do that, and also because he was so uniquely special. It seemed like a betrayal. If, if you, if you, but the way I'm looking at it, it allows you to say what the kind of good hall and less good hall really is in terms of the, these exercises in rhetorical and political mediation, okay? Uh, and it allows us to look at the later work that seems to drift quite far away from Marxism, and it allows us to say that that's true. You know, there's no quite, I mean, you know, he had a lot of trouble with, am I a Marxist, does it matter? Um, what does post-colonialism do for Marxism? Does it, does it involve a rejection or a disruption, etc.? cetera? Um, he was very keen on Foucault and Derrida in little bits and pieces. I don't think he actually read Derrida, but uh, that speaks to his credit, probably. Um, anyway, so I would rerun the whole production line in that kind of way. And it allows us to flag up, for example, three brilliant but currently undervalued essays of, ninth, of the 1970s. In fact, all in 1977. Three classic Hall essays in 1977. It's almost like those three incredible albums by Bob Dylan in 1975, Desire and Blood on the Tracks and uh, Street Legal. Uh, so... <laughs> so um, Three essays, one on class and class structure in, in, uh, in, in a book that was the, the, the written up version of a marvelous conference where Pulantzis came over to London and Paul Hurst was at his, his brilliant best, deconstructing best, and, and that was one of Stuart's greatest ever performances, I think, and one of his best ever essays, meticulous. When Stuart decides to that he's really digging into some of these questions. He's a very meticulous scholar. Whereas, so that's one, there's another one, base and superstructure in Marxist theory, 
uh, uh, and another one in a, in, a, in a volume of cultural studies papers that I was the main editor for called On Ideology, uh, uh, called The Hinterland of Science, where he does an incredible scan through the sociology of knowledge and again, always inclusively. He never rules anything out. This is the work of a mediator. How can you be inclusive to more or less everything and yet not look as if you're mushily, infinitely pluralistic? It's a tremendous trick to pull. And it's only his commitment to Marxism, I think, that stops Stuart being the kind of pluralistic mediator who ultimately no one is ever going to listen to because there's no bottom line. I think that's my bottom line, is there has to be a bottom line. And for Stuart Hall, the bottom line was always a basic kind of Marxism. Because without that bottom line, you do become the Baumannian interpreter, listening to everybody, valuing everything, ultimately saying nothing. So how Stuart managed to, 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 to weave his way between a low-level bottom line in Marxism, and it was a low level, but it never went away, and that's what enabled his mediational exercises, his inclusivity, his diagnostic generousness. Uh, that's, what, that's what made that have ultimately some, some anchoring, some, the, the little bit of the legislator who's still in the mediator. So I would highlight those three essays uh, of, of 1977, beautiful articulations of, of, of both ends of the chain of Marxism, base, culture, base and superstructure, culture, culture and economy, against what has been a very celebrated e e essay by Hall, namely the Marxism Without Guarantees essay of 1983 where it seems to me he, he acknowledges what he calls the immense force of post-structuralist ideas to the point where he can't rescue anything of Marxism at all. It's meant to be Marxism without guarantees, but it almost says we don't really want any guarantees of anything. We just want to be sort of completely open to everything that's vaguely interesting. So he talks about we, we can't quite ever, all the time, give up on some aspect of Marxist categories, uh, at least not in a religious way, and then blah, 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 and it goes on for pages and pages making these kind of qualifications, and ultimately you think, mm, that, that's, that's not the right balance between, uh, between the baseline and, and the embracing of other positions. So I think that's, this is me being critical, I don't think that's one of his, his best essays at all. I'd, I'd recommend those other ones. Now, what I, what I would do then, but I'm not going to, is I, I think it's very worthwhile looking at the key writings of the, the Thatcherism Hall, especially the middle chapters of The Hard Road to Renewal, which called, uh, I think it's called a theoretical section, where again there's some very interesting and strenuous good combinations of, uh, of a basic Marxism, although understated, and, and a pluralistic openness. And this is quite remarkable, and it shows you what nobility Hall had, because it's a response to a series of ruthless, brutal critiques by Bob Jessup, who said that Hall's analysis of Thatcherism was, was idealist, that he didn't even get the ideology of Thatcherism right, that he's got that he, he 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 had no real that Stuart had no real appreciation of of the structural elements of the Thatcherite conjuncture, that he grotesquely exaggerated Thatcher's popularity amongst the British people because the, the figures don't prove don't show that etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Very very hard hitting, and Stuart comes back because he's primarily an inclusive mediator, and for whom commonality of discursive space on the left is more important than his ego, he comes back and says, do you know what? That's a very important critique. A very important critique. And he's saying that the critique is right in many ways. But 
he still, uh, so he says that he wasn't arguing for ideologism, superstructuralism, he wasn't arguing that Thatcherism was, that was all conquering, etc. He just wanted to bend the stick away from a kind of structural reductionism to saying culture, ideology, consciousness needs its own level of attention. So that's the kind of noble nobleness about Stuart that I don't think anybody else in that kind of tradition has had because it involves a certain paradoxical modesty, the central canonical figure who's actually intellectually relatively modest and wants to do the work of inclusion to the best possible effect, even if it means accepting that I, Stuart, have been given a bit of a kicking here. Then I would look at... Nearly finished. Then, then I would look more controversially, perhaps, at Stuart's key post-colonial writings. The West and the Rest essay of 1992 and When Was the Post-Colonial essay of 1996. Both, I think, terrific pieces of work and much better than some of his other interviews on these questions. And this, this is where you see Stuart taking, taking strong influence from Homi Baba, as well as, of course, uh, Edward Said, and stretching the commitment to Marxism pretty much to the, the breaking point. But in both essays, towards Foucault in The West and the Rest, and towards Derrida in When Was the Postcolonial, he's being provocative. He poses the questions that Foucauldian regimes of truth breaks, ideology analysis, and that Derridean deconstruction breaks any notion of a definitive reading, leaves us completely agonistic. Um, he, he takes that to the brink, I think, but then he comes back. And finally, even in the very interesting, very uh, challenging, one of his last great essays on uh, the multicultural question, he says... The multicultural question, the way in which it challenges Eurocentric and including Marxist notions of progress, of class unity, of, of even explanatory competence, he says that this question uh, outruns, outruns any of our current vocabularies of understanding and action. It almost puts it into the totally agonistic... <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do about this. I don't even know how to think about this. But we mustn't take this question of multiculturalism with the usual uh, culprits, with the usual, the usual suspect way of analyzing it. So a tremendously open-ended essay. But I would hope to show that there are one or two little places where the bottom lines fall back into place because he can't quite think outside this broad, Sartrean, horizontal Marxism that I've tried to recommend to you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Euh, nous avons donc le temps pour des questions. Euh, de, euh, si vous avez des questions, rassurez-vous, si vous souhaitez les poser en français, je peux euh, me permettre de faire la traduction pour uh, Gregor. Euh, donc voilà, est-ce qu'il y a un micro, je crois Oui, oui ici. Merci beaucoup. Donc. Je vous laisse encore un, un petit temps d'hésitation, sinon je me lance pour ouvrir le bal. Le temps de digérer tout ça. Hi, uh, Greg. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about your uh, question of the insiders in cultural studies and the outsiders, and more generally about cultural studies and the way it, where it's going. Kind of the question of this ongoing question of um, uh, where is cultural studies going? What direction is it going in? You know, we need to take stock. And it seems that it's kind of a mini, almost a mini publishing industry in, on that very question. Is there a danger? Do you think? that we kind of focus too much on the figure of Hall. And the question of cultural studies bec becomes a question of what did Hall really think or did not really think? <laughs> 
Yes, uh, thank you, Kieran. Um, well, I, I mean, I agree with your, your, your question in a way. You know, it's undeniable that he is the central figure. And being canonical, people just try to squeeze too much out of what Stuart wrote, what he said. I mean, Stuart was, you know, he was an extraordinary um, uh, dynamo. And he would end up doing a lot of the major articles and talks and interviews that he, uh, he's remembered for off the top of his head. And he would be the first one to say, look, that's all off the top of my head. Don't, don't turn it into something it's not. Um, so there is a problem about Hall's canonicity, and, and I think, you know, he, here we are. Uh, is there cultural studies without Hall? Um, at least cultural studies in any paradigmatic sense. And this is, an, this is an interesting theoretical question because, of course, some of the centerpiece articles by him and Richard Johnson are about the different paradigms of cultural studies, and, and the answer is always a mediational one. We, we want a paradigm that's got a bit of all the paradigms. But Richard uh, had an essay of about 1984, I think, where uh, I, think it's, I think it's called What is Cultural Studies Anyway? Where he said, you know what? I, I think we need to lose all this paradigmism. Now, I thought that was, I disagreed, but, uh, and I don't think it's a great essay, actually, compared to his Three Problematics essay of 1979. But still, it's a very challenging piece, because can we have a cultural studies without some kind of paradigmatic framing that's usually, we're the paradigm that actively, engagingly uh, energizes the best bits of the static paradigms, culturalism, structuralism, and so on. So, but, but then you think, well, can you have a non-paradigmatic cultural studies that, that isn't pretty much akin to any... I mean, there, you know, there are loads of fascinating currents of thought and modes of inquiry around. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff in... Actor network theory, or STS, or, or, or uh, the new empiricism, where people are trying to get away from epochal understandings, which are the things that produce paradigms, and, and trying to have a kind of critical, observational, appreciative grip of whatever's interesting culturally around us. Well, is that cultural studies? Is it, I mean, yeah, yes, in a way, but it's not cultural studies. It, it won't produce a kind of methods textbook. Um, so, uh, so I think I think it's a very very interesting question, and and because because I only catch up with the writings under the sign of cultural studies every so often. That's that's why I'm I'm here to listen to whatever the latest news from the sign is. Merci. Thank you, guys. Quelqu'un d'autre? Oui, David. <coughs> Thank you, Gregor, for a very critical talk. Um, I was very interested in what you um, said about Stuart Hall sometimes pushing Marx to breaking point. And I wonder whether the reliance on Gramsci sometimes pushes Marx to breaking point. And I'm thinking of uh, Stuart Hall's involvement in the magazine um, um, New Times in the, in the 1990s, where, which started off as a journal of the British Communist Party and ended up being almost Tony Blairish, pushing social democracy way beyond socialism, um, I'd like to know what you think about this involvement of Stuart Hall. And I've got a, a second question which may or may not be related. Um, I wonder whether the, the essay by Frederick Jameson on the vanishing mediator is, is, is relevant to your analysis of uh, Stuart Hall as a, as a mediator. Thank you very much for both of those questions. Just, just on, on the second one, uh, yes, I do. I, I, I think Jameson, well, of course, Jameson has great sympathy for, for Sartre as well. Um, 
And I think Jameson has also produced probably the most astute intellectual summary of cultural studies. Uh, I can't remember what it, what it was now, but it's, uh, it's an overview of cultural studies where he gives a spin on the theory of articulation and quotes both Catherine Hall as well as Stuart Hall, uh, that to me is the most convincing rendering of that. So yes, uh, thanks for that, and uh, I'll, I'll need to make sure I mention that particular essay, The Vanishing Mediator. Yeah, so that's good, thanks. The, the other question, well, of course, it was called Marxism Today, not New Sorry, Times, but, that, but New Times was one of the, one of the little um, you know, uh, signature tunes that came out of it. Stuart, um, but because of that Gramscianism, because Gramsci, like Lenin, but in a totally different way, represented an intellectual, what's the phrase that Gramsci used, revolution against capital. Um, so it was kind of putting the political and cultural superstructures first and denying any Plekhanov-type claim that you had to sort of have the socio-economic base doing its thing before revolutionary change could happen. Uh, of course, he, he liked that, that bit of Gramsci, yeah. and at times it's hard to see Gramsci as, as a Marxist as such. But, but hey, hang on, I think you can, and I think Stuart knows this, so when the New Times, not paradigm, I don't want to use that, but when the New Times uh, 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 nomenclature uh, started to turn towards, uh, you know, we might, we, the, the, the pure superstructuralism, you know, um, novelty. It was the new in the New Times that Martin Jakes and others started to get very excited about because it's very, it's very metropolitan and, you know, very... Uh, that, that's, that's what we do. We break with everything. It's breaking that's exciting. Staying with things, well, that's really tedious, you know. But I do want to flag up that Stuart, and uh, I, t I talked with Catherine about this not so long ago, and she, she said he, he would never give up anything. He always wanted to add things, never give things. So I think, I think the people who were wanting to break decisively into new anything... Um, gradually he, he lost uh, uh, solidarity with. So when it comes to the writings on Blair, in Marxism today, um, he is, uh, he's withering about, uh, about new labor being... Uh, uh, um, uh, he wants to analyze new labor in, in the old way, in the old structural and cultural way that comes from Marxism. So the New Times, and he wouldn't, although he didn't do this, he never forgot that New Times requires a structural socio-economic analysis in the, on the question of post-Fordism, changing technologies in the, in the productive forces. He, he would never say that that wasn't necessary. It's just that's not what he did. He focused on the more ideological dimension. So I think at times... Um, in those pieces, uh, and they're not my favourites because I think they're so truncated that he didn't do as much as it were homework or display as much homework as he would do if he was told to, you know, make a proper book out of it. So we we have the benefit of hindsight now too. Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, he did too. Uh, he, ne he never said that any of what he did in the New Times stuff was wrong. He, he, just, he just insists that although people like Jeff Mulgan, Martin Jakes and others were, were part of that coterie the way he was, you know, they crossed the line, or people like Mulgan did, because that was, just that, that was the way out and beyond not only of Marxism, but of, as it were, decent social democracy and into Blair's... For, uh, uh, you know, continuation of neoliberalism. Thank you. Oui. Monsieur, merci, David. Pardon. Je voulais poser une question à propos de Gramsci et la notion de parti. Euh, 
parce que Gramsci pensait le parti comme un intellectuel. Et donc, où est-ce que cette conception est présente à l'intérieur de, de, de l'univers des cultural studies Du coup, vous pouvez développer l'idée, du coup, pour Gramsci, qu'on soit bien d'accord, que je vous comprenne, il est parti de, du, du principe que, que le parti politique, le était, parti politique était un intellectuel. Un intellectuel, en tant que tel. oui, et collectif, qui formulait et. Voilà. Et après, une autre petite curiosité. Et on sait que eh, Wittgenstein était en relation avec Jaffa. Et Jaffa était en relation avec Gramsci. Et donc, au, au, je voulais penser à cette idée de Wittgenstein entre, enfin, la relation qu'il mettait entre langage ordinaire, forme de vie et, si, et système de valeurs. Voilà. Merci. Merci. <rire> um, uh, the, the first question uh, is very interesting. The, the, thing, the thing to remember about cultural studies at Birmingham is that we were just students, <laughs> just young people with an exaggerated sense of our own importance. Um, uh, so cultural studies, I mean, of course, because we studied Gramsci, then we were well aware of Gramsci's notion of the party as the kind of collective intellectual. But quite a lot of us, for our real politics, if you like, belongs to different parties. The Communist Party, the Labour Party, the Socialist Workers Party. And I think it was in, I think it was in those more genuinely concrete political settings that we thought of the party as an intellectual, as a collective intellectual. Within the Birmingham Center and cultural studies since then, always had the rhetoric of um, trying to be some kind of organic intellectual. But I think that was slightly megalomaniac and, and never quite sincerely believed. Because I think we were always aware that we were doing PhDs, doctoral student studies. We, we wanted to be academics. We, we were absorbed in the ideas and in the reading. And that there wasn't any absolute fusion between Marxist discussion and what we actually needed to do in society. It, you know, it was a very left consensus. But within Birmingham, certainly, uh, there would be quite sharp debates about whether the alternative economic strategy or the British road to socialism or something like that was the way to go. And that tended to say just a little bit under the surface. So I'm not sure cultural studies as such is, is so genuinely political as opposed to being mainly intellectual as to take the question of the party as the collective intellectual as seriously as, as you are posing, and as seriously, as, of course, as Gramsci took it. Um, your second question um, uh, finds me out, out of my depth, um, but I think that series of connections that you're making is very interesting. Wittgenstein, Schraffer, Gramsci. Uh, 
you know, Wittgenstein, of course, is very popular again these days that, that you know, you, there's no such thing as critical detachment from, from the world you are, you are part of. Your, your, your discourses constitute a form of life. And I think Gramsci definitely had sympathy with that in, in, his, in his real attempt to upgrade the whole notion of the national popular not to have Marxists and communists sneering about the religion of, of the people. Um, so I can see there's, 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 in purely scholarly terms, I've no idea whether there's any real linkage between Wittgenstein and Gramsci, but in terms of a more kind of interpretative rather than legislative paradigm for theorizing the popular, I can see there's definite links there. Schraffer, I don't know enough about, but, but I do know there was a very good collection on Schraffer in the, in the 70s that made some of the connections you're making. You know, why isn't Schraffer a standard Marxist economist, for instance? Was always, why isn't he Ernest Mandel? Um, and I remember the answer from those who knew Schraffer's work well is, is that there is, that, that Schraffer, although of course, Technically, he produced equations and what have you. He, he did have a cultural notion of economic rationality. So yes, that would put him on that kind of more interpretive side as well. But thank you. That's, uh, I hadn't thought very clearly about that. Merci. Peut-être le temps pour uh, une ou deux questions encore. Je vérifie avec... Uh... Donc, euh, on pourra peut-être prendre une dernière, dernière question alors. courte et une réponse courte, s'il vous plaît. Euh, bonjour, euh, je, bon, je, veux, je vais essayer de poser la question. Je vais revenir un peu euh, sur cette euh, définition, catégorie de définition de Gramsci par rapport à Foucault. Parce que normalement, euh, si bien Gramsci, il, il part sur deux catégories d'intellectuels, l'intellectuel organique et l'intellectuel euh, euh, traditionnel. Mais il y a une contribution intéressante de le débat du, du côté de, de Foucault. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Donc, et, et Foucault il parle plutôt d'une intellectuelle spécifique. Donc, euh, c'est intéressant la manière comment il y a un débat autour des deux intellectuels euh, qui c'est plutôt euh, marxiste comme, comme Gramsci et, et, et Foucault qui essaye à prendre distance avec les marxistes. Et, il commence à, à, à poser la question des catégories spéciales, c'est-à-dire une intellectuelle spécifique. Ça, ça, mon question, c'est plutôt du point de vue de cultural study, la catégorie des dirigeants. Soi-même, dans un processus d'organisation sociale, que ce n'est pas la même chose comme une, une organisation politique. Donc, comment, par exemple, euh, c'est quel est le défi aussi pour cette catégorisation et la manière de l'étudier ou, ou remplir sur la réalité Moi, je suis anthropologue, je fais mon, mon test sur cette ce débat du point de vue anthropologie au Mexique. Et, et, et c'est ça que j'ai trouvé la, la question des défis du cultural study face à euh, ces catégories de dirigeants, par exemple. Comment, comment on pourrait développer plus et différencier la, la question du euh, intellectuel et, et dirigeant au leader aussi, que ce sont trois choses vraiment différentes par rapport aux contextes socioculturels. Merci.
Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, first point I would make is that I'm not sure there is really a debate between Gramsci, Gramscians and Foucauldians. I, th I think they're different schema and they're useful for different purposes. So, I mean, except, of course, insofar as Gramsci does still have this notion, whether it's through the party as an intellectual or whether it's through, uh, 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 you know, leading, leading ideas, organic intellectuals. Um, he, does, he does have a, a, a positive, a favorable notion of the intellectual leader who is also political. I think Foucault is always trying to deflate that kind of idea uh, analytically, but also normatively. I think, although Foucault describes it as a kind of interpretative schema, he wants to suggest, really, that the specific intellectual is more important than the general intellectual. And that, of course, goes along with his um, theory of, well, if it's a theory, his approach to, to power knowledge. Because if the key things about the constitution of regimes of truth and apparatuses of domination are, are local, um, uh, uh, capillary in nature rather than from the, the sovereign seat of power, which is what he argues, then specific intellectuals are the ones who precisely because of their located specificity are the ones who, are, who generate the machinery and motivation for whatever regimes of power um, are operating. Now, Gramsci is still, despite being, you know, understanding the, the popular, he's still coming from the Marxist tradition, which Foucauldians would say in all its forms, and I think quite rightly, still operate with a kind of sovereign notion of power rather than a dispersed notion of power. So Gramsci uh, still wants to have the notion of the, in, the, the political intellectual, whether in individual or collectively embodied form, as the, the ones who will lead the next progressive state of general transformation. And Foucauldian governmentality theory is suspicious of that that kind of assumption. So I think there's a debate there, but there's also a sense in which, if you wanted, you can have a bit of both Gramsci and, and Foucault. Within the cultural studies tradition, at least, at least until probably the late eight, uh, 1980s, the Gramscian version would be the one that was um, supported, to the point where someone like Stuart Hall was regarded not only as the spokesperson of the right type of intellectual, he was the right type of intellectual. Because uh, say what you like, there he was, shifting political notions of Thatcherism at the same time as doing cultural studies in a, in a more academic sort of way. So he, he was the, the Gramscian intellectual for many of us. We, you know, you thought, this, this is the right way to be if you want to be driven by ideas but also effective in society. Well, you know, you, you can't find... Uh, it's hard to find Foucauldian intellectuals, uh, you know, on the barricades or, you know... And that's just the nature of the theory, because he's interested in the mechanics of power, uh, and that requires specificities of expertise. Foucault, Foucault's notion is much more interested on how does expertise and authority work in the way in which any particular configuration of power knowledge works. Um, Marxists and Gramscians don't, don't tend to think that's not, maybe not so relevant, you know? I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Je crois qu'il faut que nous nous arrêtions là.